Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming today. Um, as part of Black Google Network, my name is Richard Cummins. Um, this is our first um, collaboration with Talks at Google. Um, we're very welcome and thankful for um, Remy Capo to coming in today um, and speaking during Black History Month um, about his new book and also an introduction um, to his life as well. So a big round of applause for Remy. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> First, I'd like to start off by thanking Google for inviting me to hold this talk. Um, this is not usual for us in the in the business of writing to actually start a book off this way, but this is certainly new. Let me start off by telling you a little bit about myself. Now, I'm, um, I came to England in 1953 when I was seven. Um, I went to boarding school. I was at the boarding school for about three or four or five years, and I ended up in a children's home for the next five, six years, a beach home, beach home residential home in Banstead, Surrey. And from there, I went on to become a cadet officer as a, because I needed to get away from England. I needed to get away from the shore. I needed to get away from everything I'd known before. And the best thing I could think of doing was going to sea. So I was a cadet officer in, in a nautical college, King Edwards. And from there, I went, after a year, I went there to, um, did three and a half years at sea with British India Steam Navigation Company. And I came, came ashore and, and took my second mate certificate. So I became a navigation officer after that, um, which meant I was the first, one of the first black navigation officers we had in England. And um, it was quite interesting actually, because from being a cadet officer, being kicked around to being an, a navigation officer, in other words, holding executive authority at a very young age, meant that all the things that people had done to you, like seamen had treated you, like, you know, badly, um, they regretted it because you now had executive authority. Until the, off, the captain, I was shown, I was given my first 12 man um, watch. So it's eight hours off, four hours on the, on the bridge. In that time I had, um, these 12 men were presented to me and the captain noticed there's two of them who were exceptionally nervous um, because this was going to be the officer of the watch. And he said, Mr. Capo, do you know those two men when they'd gone? I said, yes. He said, gave you a hard time today. I said, yes. So can I give you a piece of advice? I thought, no, I didn't want a piece of advice. I wanted to get my own back. No, no, no. He said, um, let me give you a piece of advice. Do nothing. Say nothing. Be very nice to them. Treat them with great kindness. He said, because all the time you're the officer of the watch, you have executive authority and you can make their life miserable. And um, which I could do. At the end of that, at the end of that three months voyage, which was from which was from Tilbury Docks, from West India Dock all the way down to Sapelin, Nigeria, and back, um, they ran off the ship. Thank you, Mr. Capo. That was a wonderful voyage. We're signing back on. And that was the first time I learned how not to use power over people and how to learn to understand what power actually looked like and felt like. Anyway, let me, let me move on. I went from there. I came ashore. I joined. I started writing for the New Statesman. From there, I went to Thames Television, um, ATV. Uh, then I became the director of the Roundhouse in Chalk Farm for seven years. And from there, I then decided to leave, leave all that and become, um, to, 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 to um, and, and um, write a trilogy. Now, this is where it becomes interesting. I thought, writing a trilogy, well, I'd never written a book before, because I remember the next day I phoned up um, some of my friends who all had been great authors, because I was living in North London, wasn't I? The intellectual enclave in North London, where everybody, all the writers and journalists lived. Uh, but Remy, you just announced you're going for 10 years to write a trilogy. I said, yes. But didn't you know? I said, well, I've never written a trilogy. I've never written a novel, for God's sake. I'd written a book, which was a book called The Savage Culture. That was a book about life in Britain as a black man on the streets of Britain and what had happened to me. But I'd never written a novel. 
which was very, very different. He said, well, I can't really teach you. And I realized why he couldn't. A, he couldn't teach me. They, they couldn't teach me very much about this. I wanted to write about slavery. I wanted to write a story which started in 1600 with a Nigerian family, Yoruba family, some Yoruba, and, uh, and uh, uh, an English family, landed gentry Catholics from Yorkshire. Now, what happened to these two families over from 1600 to 1966, which is almost 400 year period? And um, I thought, well, let me read about slavery. Now, I, I could find many things about slavery to do with abolition, but the actual issue of slavery itself, the actual mechanisms, how slavery was used, how slavery worked, the business of slavery, couldn't find anywhere, hardly anywhere. Why? It's almost as if somebody in, in this rush to write about abolition, which was the nice end of the, of, of the wedge, nobody, you know, the unpleasant end, which would have been unpleasant for black and white, um, that was left behind, that was kind of left out. Nobody wanted to deal with that. Therefore, I couldn't find almost anything to do with the, with, with, with the business of slavery. So I realized what I'd have to do. I'd have to write one, first of all, before I could write the novel. I'd have to write the history book. And that's what I set out to do. Now, what else did I want to do? I wanted to write a book that was going to captivate and hold both black and white readers, because I noticed that the whole issue of slavery we had, it made some people feel guilty, some people were angry, some people just didn't want to read about, deal with it. But for me, it was very, very important because inside some of the worst catastrophes in the world, you'll always find a human compassion. You will always find contact before, between human beings. I had a friend of mine, Yehuda Siegel, Jewish, met his wife in, in Dachau um, in, in, in the Second World War. And one of the questions I asked him is, was there no, not one German who took compassion as to the way you were being treated? Because it's horrific what they were going through. He said, yes, we did. We, we depended on some of the Germans because some of them couldn't, couldn't take it, couldn't, you know, couldn't accept what was going on. Well, equally was went on with slavery. So I started looking at the issue of slavery even more, more closely. When I looked closer, I began to realize that what we were talking about was a minority of people, both in the West African coast and in Britain, conducted slavery, owned the slaves, owned the plantations, and therefore they were also from that minority came the educated, the educated minority, who also were going to be the ones to write the story. Well, obviously, those who are going to write the story were also going to, very human thing, but we don't really want to put this bit in, because that's a bit unpleasant, and so is this bit. So it started picking and choosing. Now, if we were going to learn anything about slavery, we need to know the whole lot. We were talking about an era when the slave trade began, where the working class of Britain were just as much enslaved as the black people. We were talking about an era when the educated minority were the upper middle class and the aristocracy and the landed gentry. We we're talking about an era that they were the ones who owned the slaves. So we we're talking about an era that this mass had almost nothing to do with slavery. And yet, when my people arrived in Britain, we looked around right across Britain. We were all convinced that every white family had an involvement with slavery, which isn't true. We'd lived with that. I'd lived with that until I began looking closely into what slavery was about. And, and when I began to, to look, the closer I looked, the more I realized slavery on, in England was conducted by a minority, was in, hand in hand with a minority of the establishment of the rich and the, and the wealthy on the West African coast. In other words, the masses of both coasts had nothing to do, virtually nothing to do with it. That made me really interested because I realized that what we're talking about, when we're talking about slavery, we're talking about a story that should interest everybody. That should, because we're both involved. 
and therefore I found my I found the the very very things that I needed to say the very things that I needed to portray in the people themselves they so there were people who helped the slaves of course there were there's one story which I thought was very which was really quite important was the issue of in I think June the 6th 1772 which was called the Law, the Mansfield decision James Somerset escaped from an American American ship I think from Rotherhithe <clears throat> he was passed through safe houses through working class areas to the hands of the abolitionists like Granville Sharp and Thomas Clarkson, who decided at that time, here we have this man is, why should he, he's escaped, he should no longer be a slave, he's now in England. So what they were trying to say is, when somebody is over here, they were no longer a slave. But that needed to be tested in the king's bench. And that's when it was tested, over a period of six months. Lord Mansfield prevaricated, went this way and that way, because here was an issue of his class that's going to affect people of his class. That's also something that's going to affect all those people out there. So what did he do? By June, he decided to free James Somerset. Now, what was interesting about that is this. They need about 150, 200 guineas. If you imagine 1772, what 200 guineas would be now, we'd be talking an awful lot of money. Where did that money come from? It came from working class people, white people, mainly white people, collecting pennies and farthings in these pubs and establishments and, cafe, uh, 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 and the equivalent of cafes and, uh, and, and festivals all over, the, all over England, especially in London just so that they could get this one black man free. And that's what made me realize that, my goodness me, if we are going to talk about slavery anymore, we needed to have stories that actually we were attracted to. We needed to read, we need to understand, because through it, we, we begin to understand what England is really about. Well, what England, who England belongs to belongs to all of us because we've all had something to do with that whole issue of slavery, which, by the way, also basically um, supported the, the, um, the finances in this country. Most of the great houses, sugar, all these, the, these huge establishments, financial establishments, were, were built on the back of slavery. That doesn't mean that I want people to feel guilty. That's the one thing we don't want anymore. We need to get rid of the guilt. We need to get rid of the anger. We need to replace it with understanding. So I thought the best way to do it was to write a story, not a history book for the people, but to write a story about people, to write a novel about people, a, a novel that people could understand how the humanity of people comes out when they see what the activity, what activities they are led to perform, just to create, just to free somebody else, just to say, I support this person, irrespective of the color of his skin. And that's what we've always had. We have always had that in England, but you wouldn't think so, though. If you look outside today, when you think of the difficulties we have with the whole issue of race, you would not, you would not think for a moment that, that, that there was that commonality, there was that community, there's that spirit that actually brought black and white people together in the 18th century to, make, to free one black man. Quite extraordinary. And that was what made me want to write, uh, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to write this whole story about slavery. Not one that was there to make you angry, because I've had enough of stories that made you angry. There's people make films that, You've seen the white community walk out of it feeling guilty. Why? That had nothing to do with it. There's nobody in this room today who was a, either a slave owner or a slave. And if there's anybody in this room today who came from a family where they'd made money from it, it's still not their responsibility. We've had enough of that. That's what's actually held us back as a people. The fact that people still feel guilty and angry about slavery, when in fact this is something that's affected us 
detrimentally as a, as, as a nation. And so I think it's about time we put the whole issue of slavery on a different footing, on the footing of novels. Because through those novels, through those stories, through the activities of people in these stories, we begin to understand how people have actually stood for each other. Now, why hadn't this issue of slavery been written about? Well, until about the 20th century, I don't think there was much written about the history of women, was there? Until the, about 1938, when A. L. Morton wrote The People's History of England, I don't think there'd been anything written about the history of the working class, the majority, for God's sake. That was the majority, and yet 1938, so if we can only come to the, the whole history of women in the early 20th century, and the issue of the working class, the history of the working class in the early 20th century, that helps me to understand why you, thank you, that helps me to certainly understand why the about black people and their relationships um, have, uh, have, uh, have come so late. Now, if you look today at our, at our diverse community, now in my generation, I'm 71. We didn't talk about diversity in 1953. We didn't, the, I don't think anybody even knew how to spell the word. And if they did know how to spell it, I don't think they knew how, what it actually meant. Now, you look around Google, you look around some of the companies today, you look around at the, 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 the young generation. When we left school, all the black ones went this way. All the white ones went that way. When my children left school, and one of them is in the room today, black, white, green, yellow, pink went that way, same thing went that way. In other words, they had a commonality. They had had a community. They had understood diversity. They lived with that. And they had learned from us that we don't want to make the mistakes your generation made. My generation, actually, my generation, my parents' generation, actually stabilized Britain after the Second World War and then held it back towards the 60s. We held it back because we couldn't find any kind of commonality. We couldn't find the difficulties. We couldn't find a way through the difficulties of race. We could not find any community. We, my generation failed England because of that. Now, when I look around my children's generation, they're doing a lot better than us. They've still got a long way to go, but they're doing a lot better than we did. And I think that's the, that's, that's the direction Britain is on. When I look at even this audience today, my God, I've got every color in the world, which I think is fantastic. When we, and you're sitting where you want to sit. Oh no, when in my generation, the black ones set together, the white ones set together, you know? And I just thought, when I walked into Google, the very first time I walked into Google, I was stunned by the array of colors, the array of disinterest as to who was who. We could not find a community of understanding, my generation. And in that way, we were the worst ones to actually lead Britain into the new, into the new century. Absolutely. And that we are actually taking now, we're being led by our kids. And that's a good thing, because at least our children are not holding, they're not trying to hold the country back. They're actually trying to find a way through. Now, that to me is important. That's why it, is, it was important for these two, I've got two books so far. Reap to the Cotton Harvest is the first one. Torrents of Fire is the second. And there's a third one to come out. That, makes, that, that will make the total um, box set, should we say, <laughs> um, of, 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 of this trilogy. Because I wanted to go to the 1960s. Why? I wanted to come not too close to our, to our where, where we are now, but close enough that I could actually um, say, this is not just how we, that we failed in a way, but how we failed. And that it would help the next generation not commit the kind of mistakes we made, 
But to have, to have slavery, not as a fearful thing, which is what we had. We were, I mean, you notice it today on my Facebook page. My son was running my Facebook page and there was a lot of people writing in, yeah, but we were the first ones to abolish it. The issue we're talking about was slavery. Who did what with whom? Who supported whom? I mean, how many stories must there be? My, um, my editor, Dr. Jill Sudbury, she has a family where in the 1720s, her family were helping a slave get a job. And they've got the history. So you can imagine the history of slavery has yet to be written. That's what we need to do. We need to write it. Now, I am just one person. There's a lot, the next generation will write it even better. And they'll have even more. Why? Because the families, personal stories will come from different families. And the, and, 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 and the government will probably release even more documentation. For instance, they released a, a document to, well, more than one set of documents, when the slave trade was ended in 1833-34, they, um, in order to end it, the slave owners said, we will lose out. So the slave owners were, were paid. The government basically used 40% of the gross domestic product to buy the lives of the slaves, to buy the slaves off the slave owners. But nobody ever thought that these files would ever come out. So anyway, it's all put down and they're all shoved in the treasury, disappeared into the treasury. One day, the government released, the, the, released those files to, guess who? University College London, who immediately went through them properly and documented them. Up they went into the, um, into the internet. And we know once it gets into the internet, it gets everywhere. Well, lots of people start saying, yeah, but we've got no money left. The fact of the matter is that a lot of the families who owned slaves then are still there, here now. They're not guilty. They're not guilty. They should, they should not need to have to stand up to say, and Richard Dawkins she did not need to say, to say but we've got none of the money is all spent a long time ago. He shouldn't have needed to say that. Um, there's a number, David Cameron. Whose, whose, whose um, ancestors also owned slaves, didn't need to excuse himself for it because he didn't do it. And that's what I'm trying to say is that what has happened yesterday happened yesterday. We don't want the families of the, of the, of the great and the good or the landed gentry. We don't need them to come and say, we've got no money left yet, but with this, yes, we know the money's there. We don't even need England to say, our uh, major cities like Liverpool, Bristol and London were built on the back of slave. We don't need any excuses for that. We just need to know the history. We will need to know who did what to whom. But we need to know mostly how it supported this, that and the other and how these industries were built over a period of time and how money was made from slavery because it's no good saying, what are the black people doing here? And I think they've already paid with their bodies. And I think that the, there's an awful lot of white people who supported them, who not only supported them, who married them. When you think of today, in Britain, we have 10% of our nation is now what? Mixed race? My own children, I'm very proud to say, my own children are mixed race. And I'm very proud of that. They're very clever, and of course every father says that, but I, I really mean it. And um, the fact of the matter is that they represent both of us. We, what are we going to do? We're going to attack them because they're mixed race? They're part of us, and they, they're the bridge between us. And therefore, what, I'd, what, 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 what I needed to say, what I needed to do was to write something that became like a bridge. So. The books I'm, I've written are for black and white. I wanted to keep both eyes of blacks and white people on the same page all the way through without feeling they are being offended in any way. Because you don't need to be offended. That's not what slavery is about. That's not what the whole story is about. The story is about something that should unite us today, not divide us. And yet it's still dividing us. 
It's dividing us because we don't understand it. We fear it. And what you fear can, can certainly divide you. And slavery is something we shouldn't fear. Any more than you know, men should fear the fact that women have been set back and, um, and that now women need to, to have one huge step forward. Absolutely, we shouldn't fear that. That should be something we should warm to simply because it needs to be done. And we need to understand the issues of, um, certainly, certainly our children need to understand this, that their mixed race status shouldn't set them back in any way whatsoever. In fact, it should give them advantage. It should give them even a bigger advantage than, than I have. And I didn't have that many advantages, but the fact of the matter is that our children should have the advantage I never had, uh, both of them, black and white. This division of black and white has, has been really promulgated very much by the whole issue of slavery. And I'm saying to you today that until we get, until we begin to realize that ish, slavery is something we control, it doesn't control us. We, f we don't fear it. We don't need to fear it. We need, we need people to, who use slavery as a, as a cudgel to bash each other with. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's why I spent two years traveling just on the long West African coast, photographing the entire British efforts of the forts and factories of the slave trade around the Caribbean and all over England. That was two years traveling. Then I did two years in the British Library, researching as much as I could on what was left. And then I did 10 years writing, um, in just to get the whole issue of slavery on a, a, on a footing that I could understand. Once I could understand it, once I realized what it was about, once I realized where it was going, then I was able to say to myself, right, I'm now in control of this, of this issue, and I'm going to be the one who are going, who's, who's going to say next, uh, where, where, where it goes to. And where it goes to is this, that slavery div has divided this country for far too long. And that slavery is something that only divides it because we don't understand it. Slavery is something that, or is an issue that people used to, it's a great pub talk to wind people up with. I mean, you can see people getting in pubs. Um, you enslaved us. Yes, but we were, the ones who, we were the ones who freed you first. Don't think that matters. It's, a, it's irrelevant, actually. It's totally irrelevant. What is more relevant is that something happened. What? And let's get this clear. In a country which is so divided by class, the biggest division of all, class is the, is the kind of like elephant in the room in England. Class is the one that everybody fears. Now, in a country that's so divided by class, that when I tell you the working class of this country, a lot of the working class of this country behaved then as they do now. Where do you think the first, when the first slaves got the first houses and places to live in the West End, I mean in the East End of London, in different parts of England, where do you think they lived? They lived in the Lord so-and-so's house or something like that? No. Working class houses. When our people arrived in this country in the 40s and 50s, where did we live? Working class houses. That's where we've always had our friendships. That's where we've always had our, our meat. Um, that's where we've always had unification. That's who we had children with. And because of that, because of that, that's why the working class in this country have been the greatest friends of black people through the centuries and still are. And, 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 and when you go to a working class pub and you, you hear, but we freed you, and they got nothing to do. They didn't even learn anything from slavery, you know? And, and that's really, really the, 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 the meat of something that didn't exist. It didn't exist. And what did exist is that a class above them perpetrated it. 
there's no need to hate them because we can't change that. What we can do is understand it. And therefore, um, in writing what I did, I wrote it to help understanding, to bring people together, to bring understanding together, not to divide. I didn't write it to um, create any to, to create any more um, kind of division that we already have. We have enough division. We have racial division in this country that hasn't changed that much. But it's changing because the next generation suddenly got tired of the uh, uh, of the of, uh, of the lack of conf the, the lack of unity. They got tired of doing the same thing. They they we couldn't find um we couldn't find any any understanding. We could not find any understanding between us, my generation. And therefore, and I, and I can see that everybody in this room, I should imagine, is younger than me, apart from that one over there, you know? And, uh, 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 and he in particular would understand this, because we went through very similar things. Um, now, if, for instance, we are now going to find um, the, 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 the um, way forward, what we need to do, I think, is to accept that holding back the next generation of black writers or women writers or working class writers is not is, is not going to is not going to solve anything we need to hear from them we need to see what read what they have to say we also need to find out that the issue we're talking about is probably one of the most exciting issues that I've come across in the time I've been here. Why exciting? Because of the things people did for each other. Wow, I was stunned by the stuff I, I found out, what people actually did, how, how people, what people were prepared to do for each other. So I spent some of my best years of my life putting that down and writing it into the form of a story that wasn't untrue. It was perfectly true. I just happened to put into a novel. Now, it's easy. It's easier to write my when I wrote my first book, Savage Culture. That was a factual book. It's much easier to write that than to write a novel of five hundred pages. You've got to be crazy to sit down to want to write a novel of five hundred pages because it takes a lot more. It takes a lot more out of you. Um, and I just think that. I mean, the last one was 400 pages, and I thought, my God, that really took a lot out of me. I'll never do this again. And next minute, it's 500. It's 100 pages longer. Um, I promise you, the next one won't be more than 650 pages. You know, <laughs> I, I'll try and keep it short. But the thing is, it is a big story. It is a big issue, and it is an issue that we need more than one set of eyes. I don't mind a black man being a white man writing as a black character. To write that book, I had to write as black and white. So what did I have to do? I had to lose my blackness, intellectually, emotionally. And you do, because one of the things, the moment somebody sits down and reads your novel and feels that this was written by a black person or a white person, you're gonna lose it. They don't, you don't want to feel anything. You really, really don't, and to lose your, to emotionally lose yourself, your the thing you've known all your life, the colour of your skin, and that black mentality, because everything out there reminds you every day you've been you're black, you're black, you're black, and suddenly one day you have to sit down in your study, and you have to lose that blackness. I remember the first time I wrote a scene where the a slave was going to be punished. Here I was, a white person was going to punish this black person. What was I going to do? Hold pull the punches, no. It took me at least six months to get over it, just to get over how to do it. Once I got, it took me about a year to understand what I was doing. But once I got into that, I found that it was easier and actually made it easier for somebody to read because they weren't going to be, have this thing being shoved in their face all the time. They weren't going to have guilt or anger, or dissension, or dissatisfaction, or they, they were not going to have that being pushed into their face all the time. So you need to lose your blackness. Now, 
if you're going to be a white man writing or a white woman writing as a black character, there's nothing wrong with that. We need to get over past, past all of that. We've had arguments in this country. There was, there was almost like an unwritten rule in the 50s, 60s and 70s that you never wrote as any other race but your own. And if you wrote as any other race, it was a cameo. Now, if you do 500 pages of something to do with a story as big as this, you have to be both. You do have to be both. Equally, if, you know, I've had women writers who've written as men, who've written as men and very successfully as well. And it can be done, but you have to do it simply because we're not interested in what your colour of your skin. We're not interested in your gender, so on, so We're interested in the story. And I don't want to shove in my face how you feel about me as a man or a woman or this or that or the other. And, th and th that's what's essentially important in writing, the, in writing this. And that's what you've got to get across because if you ever get into film material, then you've got to, it's got to be balanced. It's that balance you've got to find in yourself as a writer. And that balance is not easy to achieve. It really, really isn't. It's, in fact, it's very difficult to achieve. But once you get the understanding of what it is you know what you're doing, it makes it much easier, far more interesting, and far more useful for the reader. Um, because you're not asking the reader to feel guilty. You're not asking the reader to feel angry. So this isn't about, this isn't about getting my, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an African now. What part did I play in the slave trade? What, what part did my people play in the slave trade? Well, we played parts of selling our own people as well as being, being sold ourselves. Um, now, West Indian, my West Indian friends, a lot of them felt feel very angry about it in the, seven, in the 60s. My God, they feel very angry about it. And in feeling that anger, you could, we could never get a conversation through more than half an hour before it exploded. Now, we've got to get past all that. We've got to get past that. People have got to understand, you, the white man, or you, the black person, was never a slave. You were never a slave owner. You were, you, 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 you were just as a person who represents those colors that's all but you're nothing more than that and the moment we begin to get past that we get into the into the area where it becomes interesting what happened so what i'm saying today is that britain needs to get away from all the things well where we know about abolition we know all about that we need to know what happened in those 400 year period of history all the kind of things so we need the shipping records, the shipping companies, like the Royal African Company, Number East, East India Company, all those, we need those records found. We need to find out which, where, they were t where they were trading to. I, I mean, I myself was fascinated as to which shipping companies would pick up from which African ports along the West African coasts. coasts. And where they bring them to in England sometimes, or straight to the Caribbean. Now, in England, we had what's called the, prime, the, the major ports, London, Liverpool, and Bristol. Then we had the minor ports, myriads of them, tiny little ones in Essex, all around the coast, even Rotherhide, Grim, and Gravesend was a minor port. And these were the middle class, one ship. Then we could do a run we could do a run down to West Africa, take 300 slaves and move it to there and sell them there. We could, we could, make, we could, we could make quite a killing. Now, all those port authorities have records. We need those records. Everybody needs those records. And it's, it's, this is what I'm saying today. That's why I've written these three, three books. I need, we need the records of the slave trade brought out so that we can have the Englishmen of today, English women of today, whatever colour, doesn't, I don't care, write the story about slavery. And in writing the story about slavery, we have a much better idea of where, which parts, what has, what has gone on before us, what has made us the way we are today. And that's why I think he's, um, I think I better leave it here tonight to give you some time to ask questions. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions. Uh, hello, Remy. Thank you very much. That was an amazing 
speech and uh, talk. So thank you for coming to Google. I have a question. I don't, not sure if you're aware on Monday, we actually had a doodle on the homepage of Google. And you, you, you know about this. My son showed it to me, oh, yes. wow. awesome. like Equiano. I'm, I'm interested to know what you, you think about that. And also I'm interested to um, kind of ask you as an African, um, how, uh, how, you, how you perceived, or how, how do you feel about seeing this doodle on the homepage of Google? Well, myself, anything that produces information about yesterday is to me to be, is, is to be um, applauded. We, should have, we shouldn't have waited for Google to do it. We should have been doing this in our newspapers. We should have been doing it ourselves in England a long time ago. It seems that it's, a, it, it's taken the Americans to actually wake us up and remind us that, I mean, we've only just remembered that, like somebody wrote, David Lelouchiger in The Guardian wrote something about that Roots is now going to be remade. Where is England's roots? Well, since England's roots always been here, the trouble is we've spent as much time as we can avoiding dealing with it. Well, the Americans have dealt with it because they can't, got no, no choice. Their, 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 their enslavement was homemade and they can't get away from it. Therefore, by them making it, we are quite happy to carry on re-showing roots and re-showing roots without any English, white Englishman or, or woman or black Englishman or woman being, being able to actually write about what we've done and make it and the BBC, the BBC of all people, saying it's time we made a film about it. Oh, no, no, no. BBC will be shamed into it in the end. Why? Because they don't know how to actually recognize English history from English people. Um, and I think that here, Equi you know, Luda Equiano is a classic example. Um, if we were going to, why hadn't, why hadn't the, say, the BBC made a film about, um, a, a, a production about Luda Equiano, a big one? Because through his life and through his example, there's so much I'm saying today, he said, before me. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm glad that Google have bothered to go and do that because it actually is reminding Britain all the time that we have a responsibility to this new generation. And the responsibility we have towards this new generation is to give them all the information and more information and allow them to get their hands on the controls because we know that with the hands of the, on the controls of my generation, not going anywhere. And, and so I'm very, yeah, that's a good question. That really is a good question. Thank you. It's, it's, Where do you think the future lies for Black History Month? Well, in effect, if, if, we, if, 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 if we follow its natural progression, Black History Month will eventually cease to exist because we will see more of our histories as a, as some, because our histories didn't happen separately. I mean, when you think, when you think in terms of slave trade, by the time, by the way we today, the slave trade, where there was black slaves, there was white people, but there's no relationship in between. It's that relationship we need to find. It's that relationship. Now, that relationship is where history takes place. That relationship is also where we need to remind people that this, um, this history, as we call it, is not history. It is um, one way of telling something. Now, the history I learned at school was white history, mainly monarchical, lords and ladies, the establishment, the big companies. And I remember the first history book I read, I think by Trevelyan in 57, had a paragraph that big. This was the whole slave trade, this 400 year period of something that actually bolstered Britain into a major trading nation, slavery, um, was a few lines, and they, they had elicited, what, 10,000 slaves. 
So I was trying to work out, you know, that young mind of mine, I was trying to work out 10,000 slaves over 400 years. That's not many, you know. I know, and as the years went on, the numbers grew and grew and grew. Now, unless we unify history, we will have to keep Black History Month to keep reminding people that black history did exist along with white history, but we shouldn't actually need that. We need our history book rewritten, clearly. And so when we, 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 we will celebrate history together, we might have a English, white history day, you know, or, or black history day, something like that. But as to, as to having, I mean, I think Black History Month is important. And I think one has to praise companies like Google for even bothering to have it. I'm amazed. But I think they understand why they have it, because they see all the people they're employing and the diversity that are, of the people that are, 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 of, of the community they employ um, to be such that they have, um, they have a responsibility to their own staff. Well, I think we have a responsibility to Britain. And I think we have a responsibility to Britain. And that's why when this government, whichever government is in, you know, when they finish all their arguing with Brexit and everything else, and they begin to realise that there's also issues, pressing issues within the nation that needs to be changed. You can't have the same old class system that we've had, which keeps things going along the same old ways that we've had up till now. And that's why Black History Month is something we should be looking to get rid of over a period of time. Yeah, absolutely. That's where, it, that's where it's, it, its direction lies. Uh, question about history. Um, so Britain had colonies all across the world, yeah. from um, Australia to India to Egypt yeah. to uh, whatnot. Uh, so why this happened only from West Africa to Americas? There could have been slaves from say india it was a populous place they could have brought them from there or from egypt um, but nothing uh, is it f forgotten history or uh, nothing happened that way or why was it I, I think it's a lot to do with them um, where you were in india the whole concept of um uh, of colonial india was in itself they called it the jewel in the crown it had everything England needed in position, in situ. So the Indians were enslaved where they didn't need to take them anywhere else. They could enslave them in India, which is exactly what happened. The Raj, as we called it, um, was not a benign, nice um, uh, 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 kind of club. It was a brutal club. It really was. I mean, the Indians tried to get rid of the English twice. There was two wars of independence, not one. And, uh, and, and, and so, in a sense, the Indians saw that and they also realised that England didn't need to take them anywhere because they could enslave them there, get everything from there. And the East India Company was a classic example. And then and headed by people like Lord Curzon, who was a great colonialist, um, they had, they, they, they had everything in place. Now, where it came to West Africa, they were talking about what well, we had need to develop. Need to de Why couldn't you just um, develop the, the, the plantations in West Africa? Well, it's a brutal land, wasn't it? I mean, they had they had um, diseases they'd never even heard of. When the I mean, the West Africa, for instance, was called the white man's grave because of all the diseases that existed along there. So taking them away from there to somewhere which is Far more salubrious, uh, which was which was far less far, far far less dangerous and far less far more controllable, was far better for for the English. And I think they they they, they were going to remember it wasn't the majority of Englishmen involved. You're talking about the small a small elite in England who owned the shipping companies, who owned the plantations, and what they were doing was developing their plantations with the sugar. They'd sell it over here and sell it around the world, make the money, build their estates, build the, build the, um, the, 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 the exchanges, the, uh, 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 and, and build, and basically build London, Bristol, and Liverpool. 
from which everything else sprang from. Now, having done that, they did not need, they, remember they also, they also had a pressure of the working class here, and they, and they were keeping them at work, enslaved in the mill towns, enslaved, work, it was an enslaved working class in England. And so I, could under, I understand the establishment in this country, why they don't want to deal with the issue, because it's a big issue, it's a much bigger issue than race when it comes to class. A much, much bigger issue than race. And it's also a very dangerous one. Um, I myself try to avoid it. Um, I touch on it in, in, in my books, but I don't, I think I need to have, I, I need to sit down with other people to work it through as to how it can be portrayed because the, the minority who, the controlling minority were never had the greatest interest of the majority at heart. And, 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 and saying that, they've never had the controlling interest to better them, in a sense. Hence, charitable, charitable companies came in. They were the ones who did the charitable works. Um, and the government itself and the state itself avoided uh, avoided all that. I think I think it, it was understandable why you never you, you never needed to move anybody away from India. You never needed to to move anybody to Africa. Africa is far too difficult. I mean, have you seen the size of Africa? It it takes in Russia, India, China, number of other nations, all in one continent. It's a huge continent, and that was far too big. It's easier to take them away from there and develop, develop it in small islands over there. And um, it's left, and what is it left? It's left a rift between black people of the same race who, to the extent, treat each other badly because one was born in the Caribbean and one was born in Africa, and yet the same race. And that's something we still have to deal with. That's an issue I find really tears at me. Because I, you know, when I when, when I meet West Indians, when I met West Indian when I was young, they don't do it so much now. But when we were young, oh, you sold us! Oh my God, Jesus Christ! I don't have any money. I mean, <laughs> I don't have anything. But the fact of the matter is that that was very, very uppermost in their minds. Almost like somebody said, "They sold you. Look at that. They sold you." That is an issue that is also still here with us. So all the issues I'm talking about are still here with us. They're, de they're issues we have to deal with. And I, and I try to deal with that in here, in this Torrance of Fire. I try to deal with the issues of, um, of, of, of the difference between the West Indians and the Africans. There's no difference. They are ours. So when we start talking about reparations, and, and people do, they talk about reparations. And first of all, they say, Britain must pay. Why only Britain? No, 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 no. If we're looking at reparations sensibly, we'd be looking at every nation in Europe that took part. We'd, be we'd look at the establishment of every nation in West Africa that was involved as well, as well as the Americas and, Sp and, Sp uh, and the um, Spanish colonies in South America, so on and so forth. Now, if you look at reparations that way, you're talking about a very small amount of money to actually reparate the Caribbean islands as an as a as nation states, and that's what needs to be done. But you cannot leave away. You cannot sort of go for Britain and leave leave outside the Africans. Oh well, because they've got problems. No, no, no. The fact of the matter is that they are Africans today, who's like we have landed gentry today, whose estates were built up on it. We have we have whole um whole areas of our, of our commerce today that was started from slavery. Well, we've got the same in Africa. And Africa needs to be involved in that as well. In other words, if you're dealing with these issues, include everybody. Don't leave anybody out. Because we have serious things to deal with when it comes to the, the differences, when we have, when the, the emotional differences between the Africans and the West Indians. There's no difference between the West Indian. Every West Indian I meet, I always call them Yoruba, you know? And 
even Sydney back there, you know? He says, I'm, I'm Nubian. No, you're not. You're Yoruba. You're one of ours. And, 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 the, and the fact of the matter is, I'm very proud of that. I really am proud of that because I recognize all our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean should have rights to go to any place in Africa. If they don't know where they're from, they have right to go to anywhere. Time off for one more question. Okay. There was a number of uh, articles in Guardian and I think New Statesman as well about uh, removing the historical status in Britain of people who were involved in sla slavery, like Cecil Rhodes, but also, uh, which was a bit surprising to me, uh, Nelson, who, who turns out was a big defender of slavery uh, in the parliament. W what's your opinion about that? My opinion is very simple as this, that brushing away history is difficult. Unwriting a book is difficult. So saying a book was written and therefore we're like Mein Kampf was written. Now, should we destroy it? It should never be written. It should never be in a library. No, it's been written. It's in a library. We should leave it there. If Nelson, Nelson was put there, I've got no problem with Nelson being there, but I think at the same time, the bottom foot of Nelson's column should be all the other feelings he had, all the other things he felt like, like some of these, um, some of some of the um, great colonists who are supposed to be so wonderful and done amazing things for India, so on and so forth. But we should also have at the foot of them, at the same time, a plaque that says all the other things, so that that satisfies both feeling, both sides of the feelings towards that individual. A very quick last question. Thank you. Um, on the question of um, technology. Technology. Uh, technology, yeah. yes, and uh, scientific developments and how we may access, access those. I'm thinking both in terms of digitization and the ability to, to search digitized records um, and also um, DNA um, and the way that we can now map uh, through our DNA um, our origins. And perhaps you could just talk about the, how these sorts of issues affected not only your own research for this but how this could have a impact for uh, future generations of researchers on the subject of slavery yes i mean well that's a good question they're all good questions actually but the part of the issue of not knowing is now to know so part of the thing of the West Indian community say in England, they should almost have a right. All West Indian people of West Indian background should all have a fundamental right for their DNA to be assessed and to, uh, 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 if they wish, and to find out precisely where they're from. If, because knowing, I know my background, I know my Yoruba ancestors, 800 years, eight, 900 years, we can almost name everybody. But that's because Yorubas were very much an isolated people in a sense, and were also conquerors, by the way. You know, they were just as co 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 like colonizers like the British. Most people were, and most of us all had slaves as well. Um, but the thing is, when it comes to, that's just one aspect of it. Find for people to know where they're from. That's a since we since. Our nation was one who moved them to here, there, and everywhere. They should have a right, to, almost like state funds should be paid for that. Um, we need, because of digitization, we are able to access a whole m amount of other information, which we need. That we've got universities, haven't we? We have researchers. We have bundles of researchers and universities where who could be put to use actually accessing um the the records for then for the, for us us and for the next generation about the whole issue of slavery and what part it played and who where the record where, where the records are what part they played and what they mean now we've got we've got i don't know how many researchers we have in universities around britain and how many of them aren't being put to use? Now, if they bother to go to do all their 
PhDs and DPhils and, uh, and, and masters and all that. Long. Surely we should also be using those same people to actually access records and to uh, 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 and and for those records to be published now one of those ones that we've got was the ucl ones which came from the treasury how many other departments of government now remember england is a very secretive nation we've got records dating back to everywhere and every time why don't we release this the records of the of the uh, of the various government departments dating back to whenever so that we can find out and use since we've got all these universities why don't we use some of our researchers to do something useful thank you very much premier <laughs> thank you very very much thank you